Hi everybody. Today I'd like to speak about the Aleman from Bach's fifth cello suite. The lute was Bach's favorite instrument and he transposed this piece to lute after writing the cello version. So from C minor for cello, he went to G minor for the lute. The manuscript did survive and I encourage you to look it up online and see the differences between Anna Magdalena's copy of the cello suite and the lute version in Bach's hand. The Salamand is in two, so let's sit a little bit on the first and third beats. <laughs> some measures are in one big beat. For example, measure number 10. Here at the very beginning, a lot of things are happening. We have alternating rhythmic units. So the first two beats of bar one are the same as the first two beats of bar two. And then that's uh, an exact transposition. The second half of the first bar has this dotted rhythm. And then again in the second bar. In other words, the second bar is a sequence, not a perfect sequence, but nevertheless a repeat in a lower octave. So let's show a difference in color. a perfect sequence it will sound like this but it is not <laughs> five the climb in beats two three and four is in terraces or steps you can of course uh, play it as a gradual crescendo but i prefer terraces as this is how it's really looking on the page it's written <laughs> Sometimes how things look on the page is a clue to how they should sound. This three-beat ascent should also be more free than the preceding material, in my opinion. So... <laughs> the dotted rhythm, which is more vertical, is less free, more rigid. You can think of this ascent as going up a hill. You start in rhythm, but as you go up that hill, it is getting harder and harder, so... <laughs> Bar six and seven form a unit. The B flat going to the C, a whole tone up. Going to the D. I've always struggled with this little figure in bar eight, the second beat of bar eight, until I realized that this is a, basically a written out ornament if you treat this second beat in bar eight as an ornament and not so much uh, in tempo not so rigid i think it will make more sense <laughs> Uh, organic and feels good. Another point I wanted to make is that we do have this B flat going to D so this bar, the downbeat of bar 8 is a little more wistful in my opinion this open G that wistful feeling on the downbeat of bar eight going back I like separating this D flat and the B flat 
last beat of bar six. So, so this is separation here. There is less separation in my opinion between the uh, trill. Here we are already in a more subdued mood. Bar nine, I like taking a little time between the tied note and the second beat and the moving 16th note. So, so here, here. So in, in bar 10, a little time. Here, between the A flat and the F. And then the 16th notes can start going down, rolling down the hill gradually. So, so rolling into it. Try playing without so much separation when uh, you repeat on the repeat of this first half. And notice how being aware of those little details add, can add so much to your performance. So let's look at bars 11 and 12. I like to give a little a crisp articulation to the third beat in bar 11, and then to the downbeat in the following bar, so. The B in the middle of bar 13 is important. Emphasize it. I don't mean to necessarily play it louder. Sometimes playing less gives it just as much emphasis. In bar 14, we have a little reminder of this pedal point from the prelude. So if you remember the prelude. <laughs> measure 15, the downbeat of measure 15, so I'll start before. See, that comes back. The scale going up starting last quarter of measure 15 needs movement. Uh, just as the one in measure five. <laughs> Try to bring out the G, open G on the downbeat of measure 17. Uh, <laughs> us to the A and B flat soon after so specified an open G and a closed one. Closed. Bach also wrote a three note chord on the downbeat of measure 17. He wrote a single note on the downbeat of measure 18. Who said Bach didn't write dynamics? So here we have a fuller sound. A smaller sound, a closer sound, maybe just an addendum. Um, on the repeat, try adding ornamentations. choose to add a short embellishment on the second beginning of the second half on the repeat 
Uh, my initial thought was to play a mordant on the B here. But I realized later that Anna Magdalena's copy has a trail marked on the low B, which is a following bar. So. <laughs> higher octave and lower octave will sound repetitive, so I took out that embellishment. <laughs> yeah. Try to play with some separation between the dotted eighth and the sixteenth notes, so... And not... come back again. I like playing this up bow and uh, it helps that surprise element. Uh, in the lute version I believe bar 22 has a slur over the third and fourth beats so so uh, you can think of this slur as a musical slur, so that kind of uh, shows you how the phrase is structured. So, in other words, you know, this F going downbeat of 23. to bring out the gesture on the last beat of bar 29 so those four sixteenth notes are not created equal i like playing the d and the c separately so ever so slightly so we can hear them it's a softer kind of attack um, also notice the step motion in a bar 29 going to 30, so So look at notes marked in red starting at bar 31. So we have a clear separation to two voices here. So this is lower voice. Again. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time.